Welcome everybody to our live stream today about pollinators and trees. So my name is Jeffrey Berry. I am CEO of Tennessee Environmental Council, founded in 1970. So we are 52 going on 53 years old. We turn 53 in a couple of days actually uh, this weekend. Our mission is to help people and communities improve our environment. And improvement is the key. When we, at the end of the day, we've done our work and signed off, we wanna look back and see that the environment we live in has improved in some way. And what does that mean? What does it look like in the long term? It looks like this. It looks like our vision statement, which is thriving habitats, a circular economy, and climate balance in Tennessee. And as you know, there's a lot of overlap in all of those areas, but we have created a number of programs that work toward that vision of thriving habitats, a circular economy and climate balance. We have a statewide residential composting program that you could all participate in. We have a tree program, which you're gonna learn about today. We have a pollinator program, which you're also gonna learn about today. There's a lot of overlap in those two, as you're about to find out. We also have a statewide Recycle Tennessee program. We're doing a series of recycling roundups events across Tennessee in the coming year and hope to do many more um, for the long term. We also have a watershed restoration, a watershed support center, which uh, is improving streams across the state of Tennessee. And under that is also a litter cleanup effort where we go into neighborhoods and creeks and pick up all the litter and recycle what can be recycled and, and dispose of the rest. And in a nutshell, that is our organization. We also have a zero waste initiative because if we don't create waste in the first place, it's never gonna end up in the environment. So we have a lot, of, a lot of work to do to improve our environment in Tennessee. We don't have all the answers, but we have a lot of them and we hope that you get involved, check out our website to get involved in more of those programs. Um, but today is a special treat. I'm gonna, we have in this live stream, we have Cynthia Hernandez, which is our tree program manager who is really busy right now getting ready for Tennessee Tree Day 2023 coming up in March. And that registration for those trees is now open. So you can visit our website to reserve your trees for Tree Day. And it'll be our ninth annual statewide tree planting event. We're approaching a million trees. We're not quite there yet, but within a couple of years, we'll hit that minute tree. Um, and Monica Pretz, who is our pollinator volunteer coordinator and will share a wealth of information and perspectives about that overlap between the pollinators and the trees. So I'll hand it over to you, Monica, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. So I will quickly share my screen. With you guys, I wait. This meeting is being recorded. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> that's, okay. that's all right. Can I start? Go for it. Oh, fantastic. So let me know. Do you see it well, the presentation? Yep. OK. So this presentation, the title of the presentation is Insect and Pollinator Host Native Trees and Shrubs. And the purpose of this presentation is to um, introduce you to many insects and pollinators that depends on trees. As Jeffrey said, um, I am working with the pollinator program, the Generate Some Bus program, and we have several beautiful pollinator gardens in, in Middle Tennessee, Nashville, East Nashville. And during these programs, we meet a lot of people and we recognize the interest and need for, for them to learn more about the, what kind of insect, what kind of pollinators, butterflies, and moths they can see in our gardens. And um, before I start the presentation, I would quickly like to mention that you probably already noticed that I myself not native to Tennessee. Uh, I'm a biologist, I'm uh, from Europe, Hungary. And I would like to encourage everyone that if you have a question uh, during the presentation about anything or you may not understand my pronunciation, please be feel free to ask questions because Cynthia and Gwen will right away answer your questions. And then um, we will have a question answers also at the end of the presentation. Okay, so I'm 
not progressing. Wait a second. Okay, now, finally. Sorry about that. So first of all, I would like to start with the benefits of uh, planting trees. Uh, and they are, of course, tremendous. And there are several reasons they are tremendous because of economic values. Trees are very important for us because we are using them for our in infrastructure. We are building houses, we are building furnitures. They are also very important for social uh, reasons. We gather at, at Thanksgiving around the table on any holidays, winter holidays, we gather around the table together. And on the summer hot days, we gather as a family under the trees that provide shades for us. But of course, this presentation mainly focuses on the environmental reasons that trees are important for us. And some of them I would like to summarize here at this slide. Number one, most important uh, benefits of trees are sequestering and storing carbon dioxide and, of course, producing oxygen. They are also very important in transpiration. It's transpiration when water leaves the, the leaves through um, the stomata and into the air and together with evaporation, they are important in cloud formation. Trees are also super important for breaking uh, the wind and providing shade. They are important for water conservation. They are sequestering water. So they are important for uh, drinking water, clean water. They are reducing flooding and erosions. They are important for the healthy soil system and so many more reasons. But today we will be focusing on three, which is the habitat for wildlife, they are important for as a food source, and they are also extremely important as hibernation site. Before I go into the trees and into the pollinators, I would like to make sure that everyone understands some of the key words or most important terms. Uh, number one is native plants. Native plants are the plants that are highly adapted to an environment in a certain ecoregion. And they are important because they evolve together with wildlife and they have a symbiotic relationship. And the other word I would like everyone to understand is the keystone species. We can talk about keystone plants and keystone animals. Today we are talking about keystone plants. Keystone plants are unique for the local web within the ecosystem and they are, are essential for insects and birds and wildlife species because of the, the food web. Another important term is the host plant specialization. So plants develop defenses during evolution against herbivores, which means in their leaves, in their buds, in their uh, flowers, they produce toxins or phytochemicals to reduce how much the herbivores eat them. Of course, insects are co-evolved with the native plants and insects use these uh, specific defenses for their own terms and they adapt to it. And because of that, 90% of herbivorous insect can only eat certain plants and they share these common defenses. Uh, one of such plants and such insect I wanna show you is the spice bush swallowtail, which is um, a beautiful, beautiful butterfly and it dependent on the spice bush and sweet bay uh, plants. Now, when we talk about uh, pollinators, I would like to make sure we all understand which, what are we covering in this webinar or presentation. So pollinators, we will talk about butterflies and moths. Uh, basically, this is the so-called order of Lepidoptera. And uh, here are some of the species, some not necessarily these that we will talk about later, but some examples. Uh, for example, the gov fritillary butterfly which is a beautiful orange butterfly, and you can see it a lot in Tennessee. And the host plant for this butterfly is the passion flower, which is our state white flowers. Or you can see here the giant swallowtail butterfly. Uh, the host plant of this one is the prickly ash and citrus species. 
The hummingbird clearwing is a moth and it depends on the native honeysuckle species. And another one, the pawpaw swing moth, which dependent on uh, eating pawpaw leaves. So these are definitely uh, examples of how uh, insects are dependent on, on native plants. When we talk about butterflies and moths, I want to definitely uh, clarify a few things about caterpillars. We have several uh, maintenance pollinator garden maintenance events. And every time I have uh, volunteers coming out, they enjoy the flowers, they enjoy the beautiful butterflies, and we try to identify different species. However, interestingly, I found it that a lot of people are afraid of caterpillars. And I like to tell people that, you know, the larva stage of a butterfly and a moth is a caterpillars, and they are kind of like the children of butterfly society. We depend the, to have butterflies, to have moths, we need the caterpillars. So basically the caterpillars, uh, you can see their development on the left side on, on the slide. And that's a monarch butterflies uh, metamorphosis. And you can see on the top, the egg that is laid by the adult butterfly on the milkweed plant. And the caterpillar will hatch from the egg and will go through a growth period and it will molt five times. Each stage is called instars, so it will go from first to fifth instar as it eats and grows. And then it will form a chrysalis or a cocoon. And um, you can see here the monarch butterfly has this beautiful green cocoon, uh, chrysalis, which when gets closer to hatching will turn transparent and the monarch butterfly will emerge. So caterpillars are important for the butterfly society as a children, but they are also important because they are herbivores. They are the converting energy stored in leaves into nutrients, animal protein, animal fat. And they are extremely important for birds, for food, and uh, for especially nestlings in the spring. Another group of pollinators that I would like to mention are the native bees. In North America, we have over 4,000 native bees. In Tennessee, 350 different species of native bees. Most native bees are solitary bees. And I would like to show you two different groups. On the top one, you can see the ground nesting bees. Uh, bumblebees, sweat bees, and mining bees, all ground nesting bees. Uh, bumblebees are social bees forming colonies of 100, 150 bees, but sweat bees and mining bees are solitary bees. On the lower panel, you can see uh, plant stem nesting or cavity nesting bees. Uh, examples of that can be the leaf cutter bee uh, that uh, nest in plant stems or mason bees that uh, uses cavities and mud to form its nest or carpenter bees that uh, create hollow in wooden surfaces. And so definitely native bees are very important um, pollinators. European bee uh, honeybees are not native to Tennessee, not native to North America. They have very important ecological importance for us, for our food source, for our crops. But um, this presentation will be focusing a lot on native bees. And this is the time I would like to mention that you can see uh, on the lower right hand side, uh, kind of a bee hotel. It is a very popular thing to put out bee hotels to provide safe home for bees. However, I would like to put it out that um, it is much better to place a lot of small bee hotels instead of one large because um, predators can find them and um, reduce the numbers. And also bee hotels are not as simple as they often look because they have to be cleaned and it can also spread diseases among bees. So if you decide to place at bee hotels, please try to find information on the best way how to do that. 
And of course, the presentation is a collaboration between our two programs, the Tennessee Tree Day and the Generate Some Buzz program. Tennessee Tree Day is our annual statewide tree planting event. This is the largest community tree planting event when the volunteers can pick up collectively bare root seedlings and plant uh, these seedlings. And this year we planted over 80,000 uh, uh, trees and we are hoping for even more for 2023. And this is the list for the Tennessee Tree Day for next year that the, all the trees that you can register for if you go to our website. <clears throat> and uh, some of this uh, tree, you can see an asterisk behind the name of the tree. Those trees will be distributed only in certain locations. Uh, you can find that whenever you register and you find the nearest locations to you, which trees you can get at that location. And basically, this is the list white oak, cherry bark oak, flowering dogwood, eastern redbud, persimmon, tulip poplar, Virginia pine, wild plum, black cherry or wild cherry, pecan, indigo bush, elderberry, and bottom bush. So the first tree that we are distributing is the oak trees. We have two oak trees this year, the white oak and the cherry bark oak. Uh, oak trees are canopy trees and um, we have 20 different oak species in Tennessee. And interestingly, oak trees are only on the Northern hemisphere but they are the most important keystone species of North America. And the reason for that is because they have enormous wildlife value. Oak trees are supporting over 500 different species of Lepidoptera. But furthermore, the leaf buds and acorns feeding a lot more birds and mammals. So hey, they hey, Monica, can you um, define the lep Lepidoptera, what are those? So Lepidoptera is the order of Lepidoptera contains the um, butterflies and moths. Yes, I will mention that several times. So thank you for asking that question. So, so about oak trees, one more thing I wanna say because it has such a huge wildlife value, I think it is uh, sad that if you cannot plant anything else, plant an oak tree because the benefit of planting an, an oak tree is just really tremendous. I would like to show you uh, with each tree or shrubs that we are uh, presenting today, one or two species. Uh, of course, I cannot show you 500 different species that are uh, supported by oak trees, but I would like to show you a few that are dependent in this tree. Uh, number one is polyphemus moss. It's a beautiful, large, giant silk moss, which has uh, two small eye spots on the forewing and two large eye spots on the posterior wings. You can see the caterpillar on the top on the left-hand side, and the caterpillar, when it reaches uh, an instar phase, uh, it will form a cocoon from the leaf of the oak and it will woven into with a silk cocoon. And the silk cocoon will overwinter on the top um, on the leaf or on a uh, stem, not stem, a branch, sorry. And uh, sometimes these uh, cocoons fall down into the floor together with the leaves. So it's very important to save the leaves because the, you can find the polyphemus moss cocoons among the leaf. Even if it falls down, it's perfectly safe until we disturb the environment. Polyphemus moss is a nocturnal animal. So if you want to protect polyphemus moss, one of the best thing that you can do is to put up motion detectors on your lights. Unfortunately, um, these moths and many other moth species are just um, attractive to our lights and they will keep on flying towards it until they 
die of exhaustion or they are eaten by spiders or other predators. So these are the ways to, pro to, to protect polyphemous moths. Um, another beautiful species that I would like to introduce is the banded hair string butterfly. Uh, this is a pollinator. It loves our white flower gardens, and, uh, but it depends on oak trees. Banded hair string butterfly will lay the eggs on dead fallen oak tree leaves, and the eggs will overwinter, survive the winter on the oak leaf, and the oak leaf will provide the first food source for these butterflies. So again, saving the leaf, leaving the leaf is very important. Juvenile dusky wing is another pollinator. I wanted to show you how beautiful the wings can camouflage into the tree trunk. And the last uh, for this, uh, for the oak is the great purple hair streak butterfly that I wanted to show you, which is a little bit special. It is the largest hair streak butterfly and uh, it is dependent on oak tree, but not oak tree itself, but all the, um, sorry, the oak mistletoe. So the oak mistletoe dependent on oak and this butterfly is eating the leaf of the mistletoe. Uh, the mistletoe itself is a hemiparasite, so it can uh, uh, photosynthesize, but it cannot uh, get the water, so it uses the oak and uh, extract the water from the xylem of the oak. Uh, so another very interesting um, butterfly. Uh, the second tree that I would like to talk about is the flowering dogwood. It's an understory tree. It supports 126 different caterpillars. So again, a very important keystone species. The flowers of flowering dogwoods are white or light pink, and it has a fruit or berry that is loved by many birds. Um, this, the flowering dogwood is host plant for the spring gazelle butterfly, which is a pollinator again. It's a small, beautiful azure uh, blue butterfly and we have seen it several times in our gardens in our Stratford High School uh, and it is a very interesting butterfly because the caterpillar is eating the leaves and also the flowers of uh, the flowering dogwood and as you can see on the picture there is a little ant on the top of the butterfly Oh, sorry, on the top of the caterpillar. Ants can be very vicious predators of caterpillars. However, this caterpillar created, uh, developed mutualism with the ant, which means mutualism is a form when it's beneficial for both species. And the caterpillar will create a sugary sap, a honeydew, which the ants will enjoy to eat and it will turn from predator into a bodyguard. Uh, the other insect I would like to mention is the Cecropia moth. Cecropia moth is the largest uh, moth of North America. It's an absolutely stunningly beautiful moth. Unfortunately, numbers are de decreasing. And the um, same way like the uh, polyphemous moth, the cocoon is formed uh, with silk and the leaf of dogwood. And by protecting the fallen leaves uh, and protecting the cocoon, you can protect this beautiful moss. Another flowering tree is the Eastern Redbud. Eastern Redbud is an understory tree and it is supporting uh, early pollinators as it is one of the earliest flowering tree. Uh, it also supports 24 different caterpillar species and loved by many bees. You can see bumblebees, but many native bees enjoy the uh, incredibly high number of flowers that this tree provides. The other bee species that I would like to mention are the, the leaf cutter bees. Um, if you have uh, red bud uh, trees, uh, you can notice it very early in the spring when the leaves are appearing that the, there will be circular cuts on the leaf. And uh, the funny story that uh, 
this spring we we planted some uh, redbud trees and my husband noticed this cut on the leaf and he was like oh something is eating our redbud tree and I was like yes we have to be happy because it means the leaf cutter bees are coming to to collect um, nesting material leaf cutter bees cut these circulars they fold up the circles and they create pollen pockets. They lay their eggs in it and they fill it in plant stems. So seeing these cuts on the leaf it is definitely a good sign that you are supporting native bees. So a beautiful flowering tree and with an edible fruit is the persimmon. Um, persimmon fruits are ripening in late fall Usually they are the best after the first frost. Uh, I had the pleasure to eat persimmon this time, first time in my life this fall. It's a really lovely, it has a very high fiber content. And uh, persimmon trees are uh, supporting 45 different species of butterflies and uh, moth species. And as you can see, it also on the flower also supports a lot of um, bees, native bees, and it has a very high honey nectar value as well. Um, you can see an ant on the flower on the left uh, corner. And this is, I think, a good time to mention that um, beetles and flies and even ants can be pollinators as well. Um, persimmon is the host plant for luna moth. You can see on the right hand side of the slide the luna moth, a very fragile, beautiful, elegant looking moth. The moth itself has a reduced mouth space and it doesn't eat, but the caterpillar eats the leaves. And um, I would like to mention that the caterpillar has uh, developed a method to scare away predators, it will create a ticking noise. And if that's not enough, then it will vomit uh, the stomach content up, which is very uh, useful because uh, persimmon leaves contain flavonoids and terpenoids. So it will deter the uh, predators. The next tree is tulip poplar or tulip tree. And this is again a tree that is special for us because this is our state tree. Uh, it is a uh, tulip poplar is important for bees and hummingbirds and butterflies. You can see our ruby throated hummingbirds enjoying um, this tree as well. It is a major honey plant. So it is for um, the honeybees also an important plant. And it is a host plant for the Eastern Swallowtail Butterfly. Eastern Swallowtail Butterflies, uh, the female, I think this is a female, are a little bit larger, more colorful than the male. And the caterpillars has a black, yellow, and blue eye spots. And interestingly, whenever they are scared or uh, attacked by predators, the eye spots get really large and they uh, mimic or try to look like a snake. So try to scare away the predators. The next tree that we will have, and again, this tree has an asterisk next to its name, so it will only be distributed at certain location, is the white plum. Beautiful flowering uh, tree. It's an understory tree with an edible fruit. Um, I think um, with a little bit of extra sugar, you can make a great uh, plum pie from this fruit if you collect it. The fruit and the flowers are enjoyed by many pollinators, like the coral hair streak butterfly will enjoy the flowers, but also it is um, the caterpillars will enjoy uh, the leaves, the flowers, but even the fruits. And while the caterpillars usually feed at night, um, the butterfly, uh, adult butterfly is um, a pollinator. And interestingly, it is addicted to butterfly milkweed. Uh, so therefore I would always suggest or encourage anyone who plant a beautiful white plum tree, also plant some butterfly 
milkweed close to it and you will have these uh, coral hair streak butterflies in the whole life cycle. The other pollinator that I would like to mention is the Henry's elfin, which has a beautiful camouflage uh, brown uh, wings. Okay, wild cherry or black cherry. Again, it is a, a tree with edible fruit and birds and mammals will also enjoy the fruit. And uh, it is the host plant for red spotted purple butterfly, but also for Eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly. The red spotted purple butterfly is very interesting because while the butterfly itself is, is stunningly beautiful with bright, beautiful colors, the caterpillar itself is really not that pretty. And it actually mimics the uh, bird poop or dropping to try to hide from predators. I also would like to mention that uh, black cherry has phytochemicals like hydrogen cyanide, which is the leaf contains it and um, it, it can be in excess because respiratory failure and even uh, death. However, this little caterpillar is able to eat it and digest it and use it for its defenses which is pretty unbelievable, I think. Whenever you are planting a garden, I always suggest to plant evergreens. And this year we, are, we have um, Virginia pine to support that. Um, it, it is host plant for imperial moss and Eastern pine elfin. And the reason to have um, evergreen trees is not just for us to have something green in the, in the winter time, but it is a great hiding place and nesting place for birds throughout the whole year. Another tree is the pecan. Pecan is again a canopy tree with edible nuts. I personally really like pecans. And I, I mentioned uh, one of the uh, host, it, sorry, it is the host plant for gray hair streak butterfly and luna moth. I have mentioned the luna moth before. However, I would like to mention now the gray hair streak butterfly, which is a pollinator. So planting pecan will support this little pollinator. And if you look at the picture on the right hand side, you can see that it has a little antenna looking uh, structure on the hind wing. And the reason for that is a so-called automimicry. So gray hair streak butterfly um, developed automimicry against its own head. So whenever the butterfly lands on the flower, it will move the hind wing and uh, it is a perfect um, way to, so one of the predators is a sp uh, jumping spiders and they will nearly always jump to the wing instead of the head. And that gives the butterfly a chance to fly away with minor um, um, injuries. And now I would like to move to some of the shrubs that we have this year. Uh, a beautiful loose airy shrub is the indigo bush. It prefers sunny or part shade areas and it has two great pollinators, the southern dog face butterfly and the silver spotted skipper. The southern dog face butterfly uh, enjoys this uh, indigo bush, but it has other host plants and it prefers uh, host plants with small leaves while the sil uh, silver spotted skipper is also a little bit finicky uh, butterfly because this butterfly always visits blue and purple flowers and red flowers, and it just never lands on yellow flowers. So it's a finicky eater. Uh, indigo bush is also favored by many bees, native bees and honeybees. The next shrub is elderberry. Elderberry uh, loves full sun and moist soil. 
and this is a, a herb, uh, sorry, it's a plant with uh, medicinal uh, benefits and edible herb. Um, back in Hungary, where I'm coming from, we use the flowers to make a wonderful refreshing drinks in the summer. Basically, we cut off the flower heads, we put it in a jar of water, we add some honey and lemon juice and keep it in the fridge for a day. And next day, it will be a wonderful, cold, refreshing uh, drink. I, I highly suggest anyone to try it. Um, but I also saw recipes when uh, the flowers are fried. So I guess in southern uh, region, frying is, is very popular. So that can be suggested too. Uh, elderberry is important for, for bees not only as a food source, but also as a nesting material. Elderberry has hollow stems and that hollow stems is a perfect uh, nesting area and overwintering site for, for uh, bees. And um, whenever you cut off, for example, the flowering parts, you create the opening for these stems and that's a perfect place for bees to get in. Um, Elderberry is the host plant for spring gazelle butterfly that I have mentioned earlier with the mutualism to ants. And also the fruits of elderberry will definitely bring a lot of birds into your garden. Uh, cardinals and grosbeak and many more will enjoy uh, and many migrating birds will enjoy uh, this fruit in your garden. And the last uh, shrub that we would like to mention is the bottom bush. This one again has an asterisk next to the name. So it only be, will be distributed at certain location. Please check if the, your location has this plant, if you want this. It is a shrub that prefers moist conditions really close to bogs and ponds. Bottom bush is often called a butterfly magnet because butterflies land on it all the time. They really enjoy the flowers. Uh, and I show you here the queen butterfly. It's a beautiful orange butterfly and it looks a little bit similar to, to the monarch. So I wanted to show you this beautiful butterfly. But uh, bottom bush is also host plant for the titan sphinx moss that you can see on the upper left side. Okay, finally, I want to show you two trees uh, that we do not have at this tree day in 2023. However, I would like to encourage anyone who is interested in to plant these trees in their yards because they are beautiful and they are important for us because they provide food for pollinators. The number one is popo tree. It's an understory tree with the largest edible fruit in North America. And one of the uh, pollinator that eats it and relies on this plant is the zebra swallowtail. The zebra swallowtail is the state butterfly of Tennessee. So if you want to support the state butterfly of Tennessee, please plant zebra swallowtails. And the phytochemicals in the popo tree are acetogenins and it's in the sap. And interesting, the, the caterpillars, similar to the um, monarch butterfly caterpillars, the caterpillar will be able to eat um, the leaves with the acetogenins and will store the acetogenins within their tissue. And because of the bitter taste, it will deter the predators. Another um, pollinator, sorry, another uh, Lepidoptera species, it's a moth, is the popo sphinx moth that also eats the leaves of the popo tree. So if you're planting popo, these insects will definitely enjoy the tree. And the last tree that I would like to mention, but again, we do not have this tree, but I wanted to show you to encourage planting is black willow. It's a beautiful native willow tree that require, um, requires wet soil. So it prefers to be along streams. And it is an important supporter of bees and hummingbirds. Um, you can see here a female uh, ruby-throated hummingbird, but it is, and also a humming, um, 
sorry, it is also a host plant for visceral butterfly. Visceral butterfly is very similar looking to the monarch butterfly. So I wanted to show you this beautiful orange butterfly. It's slightly smaller than the monarch. And the most distinguishable feature is that on the posterior wings indicated by the red arrow, there is a black line. So that's how you can distinguish it from the monarch. Visor butterfly also has a caterpillar that mimics uh, bird droppings, and that's how it hides from predators. So I told you about the trees and the pollinators that you can expect in your gardens if you plant these trees, but there are of course other ways to support pollinators in your garden. The most important part is, of course, to plant in so high diversity native plants, native trees, shrubs, and even a pollinator garden. And of course, remove invasive species, which means invasive species, if they are in your garden, they occupy the space and they do not feed any of our native pollinators. So the best really to remove them. Uh, to support the pollinators, it's always good to offer drink for pollinators. We had an extremely hot summer this year. And by placing a shallow bowl in your garden with water is a good way to help them. I would also suggest to maybe put some pebbles in the water so it provides an easy landing site for butterflies and bees. Most importantly, avoid using insecticides and herbicides. Insecticides and herbicides can, be, um, can harm our pollinators directly, indirectly. It can also harm their nesting sites. If they are herbicides on the ground, will disturb uh, bees, uh, ground nesting bees, for example. But also for ground nesting bees, it is important to avoid ground cover. Landscaping fabric will not allow bees to find their home in our grounds. And also mulching will disturb the bees and they will leave the sites. Other way to support pollinators are to, and one of the most important as well, is to leave the leaves. This is the fall, leaves are habitat. Uh, I showed you a lot of different you know, pollinators and insects that overwinters as, as eggs, as caterpillars, as, as a cocoon, uh, but there are butterflies like the uh, morning cloak butterfly, which uh, overwinters among the leaves as an adult butterfly. So it is very important not to burn your leaves because then you are polluting the air and burning the insect that are hibernating and feeding on the leaves. Don't put your leaves, the collected leaves into the trash. Our landfills are, are full. We are facing a, a landfill crisis and the leaves sent to landfills will create a methane as they uh, decompose anaerobically. Um, a lot of people collect the leaves and place it in bags. And those bags, most of the time, go to uh, composting facilities. Uh, leaf mulch, a leaf compost is really good on a sense for it, it's a good nutrition for plants. However, um, Industrial composting facilities has a very high temperature in the compost pile and it will kill all the insects in the leaves. So whenever you are sending the leaves away, you are sending your butterflies, your moths, your insect away as well. And also uh, low, uh, low mowers will not only chop up the leaves, but they also chop up our wonderful beneficial pollinators. Every third bite you take depends on the pollinator. So whenever you do all these things, please think of them. So instead, what to do? Number one, leave the leaves. Number two, save the stems. Uh, the best thing that you can do is leave the leaves where they are. If you cannot do that, uh, then collect the leaves with a rake and place it under trees or shrubs. Leaves are wonderfully suppressing weeds. 
and they will slowly break down. They will feed your trees, feed your shrubs and provide habitat over wintering site for insects. If you cannot do that, you can collect them into a composting pile, uh, home background, backyard composting piles usually do not produce such a high heat and insects will survive in them. Uh, if you live in a neighborhood with neighborhood association and you have restrictions and rules, then I suggest to find somewhere in the backyard an area where you can keep your leaves. Um, also, like I have to cut down my plant stems in the, in the fall because of my regulations in the neighborhood. My suggestion is, again, find somewhere in backyard an area where it's, you can keep them, maybe um, create a loose bundle of it, and insect will find it and they will find a safe haven among these stems. And finally, I want to mention that when you are doing all these things, you are creating a healthy, balanced habitat. Caterpillars, of course, are eating your leaves, but they are not eating as much in a healthy habitat that would disturb the trees. And one of the reasons for that is the, are the birds. Birds, 90% of birds feed their insect, feed their babies with uh, caterpillars. Caterpillars are full of nutrition, amino acids, and um, animal fat, and they are full of carotenoids, which means carotenoids are necessary for the bird's immune system. It's necessary for their eyesight, and it's also for the beautiful coloration. So whenever planting native plants, native trees, native shrubs, or herbaceous plants, these caterpillars are already feeding the bird population. Just an example, the Carolina chickadee can feed 69,000 caterpillars within 16 days to its nestling. That's an enormous amount. So how to support your birds in your garden? First of all, plant native plants, trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants. Provide water for your birds uh, throughout the winter or year. And, uh, but make sure please to clean uh, the bird bath uh, for your birds and also for your own safety, clean it regularly. You can provide food for your birds over the winter. It is um, very entertaining for sure. Um, although if you have native plants, they will find the caterpillars, they will find the insect among the leaves, they will find the, the seeds and the berries that your shrubs provide. Uh, you can also put out nesting box that also has to be cleaned uh, after the nesting periods. And I would like to mention one very important thing is to stop feeding your birds in the spring. Dry food is not efficient food for nestlings. Um, they require the soft caterpillars uh, which is high in amino acids, proteins, and fat, and it's high in water. Dry mealworm can harm the baby birds, so please avoid feeding your birds in the spring. And also, it will help your garden because they will eat enough caterpillars, so your trees, your shrubs will not be hurt by the insects. And the most important slide is save the date and register for the Tennessee Tree Day, which is coming up in March 18 in 2023. And we hope to see more and more people join our program and plant trees and uh, have more native trees, shrubs and wildflowers in Tennessee. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Monica. That was excellent. It's nice to see the benefits that we often don't think about from the trees that we are distributing for Tennessee Tree Day. Um, and so all the trees that Monica showed, as she mentioned, are available right now to reserve for Tennessee Tree Day 2023. Just visit the website. Um, I'll go ahead and um, post it in the chat, but you can visit tectn.org tectn.org slash Tennessee Tree Day. Cynthia, go ahead and put the, that link in the chat so everyone can just click on it and reserve your trees right now. 
Tree reservation will be open through the end of February, um, but you will get your best selection when you order early, which would be like now, um, the next month, uh, the next few weeks. So, um, but to see that when we plant these trees, we are providing habitat for hundreds of caterpillars and of course, with the associated benefits to our native birds and to other pollinator insects as well. It's, it's phenomenal to see that. Thank you so much for doing the research and putting together an incredible eye-opening presentation, Monica. And um, I didn't introduce Gwendolyn Blanton earlier, but she is our pollinator program manager. So um, Gwendolyn and Cynthia are available to moderate the questions. Um, Cynthia, Gwen, do we have any questions that you want to pose for Monica or we might punt back to Cynthia or yourself? Jeffrey, I see that there are two hands raised, but I'm not sure if I have the right protocols assigned to me because I wasn't able to post a, a message to the entire group, I don't think. Can you just check the controls there? Yeah. Um, okay, well, if you want to relay a message to me, I'm happy to type it in, but I'll see if I can change the controls too. Okay, now I'm changing it so that you can now um, address everyone. And attendees can chat with everyone. Sorry, we didn't fix that earlier because then you could have had a more robust conversation there. Um, but feel free to chat away because the chats are wide open now. But Cynthia or Gwen, do we have any questions from the audience that you know, have come in? Uh, I see that uh, Rosemary Marshall has a question. You want to type your question in the chat, Rosemary? And Cynthia, you are on mute, so if you had any. Well, we have the question, is this Zoom event going to be available um, to, to watch again later? And the answer is yes. It will be on uh, Tennessee Environmental Council's YouTube channel. And we will also send it out to our email list uh, as a link um, in a future e-newsletter. It's always great to hear that, um, yes, that these presentations are recorded um, so you can spread them far and wide. You can listen to and watch and d dig in deeper, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. Thank you, Diane, for the, the compliments. It's always nice to see a fellow pollinator and native plant advocate out there. If you guys who have your hands raised can Lee. Um, and Brandy Pruitt, if you could just type your question into the chat, then we can we can see what your question is. We'll try to answer it. Uh, Kim has a question that she's on her website, but doesn't see a place to register for tree day. So if you haven't already, yeah, it's, it's in the chat now, Kim, but Gwendolyn, go ahead and put it in there again. Um, because if you go to Tennessee Tree Day, what you do is there's a map on there on Tennessee, on the Tennessee Tree Day page, which is tectn.org slash Tennessee Tree Day, tectn.org slash Tennessee Tree Day. At the top of that page, there's a map of Tennessee. You click on the flag closest to your town or where you think you would want to pick up your trees, and the link to register will be in that, in that uh, flag or button on that map. That way you'll know you're ordering from trees close to home. Because we have set up, and, and Cynthia led this effort, but we have set up 150 locations across Tennessee where you can reserve your trees. And we will have native trees at all of those, although some of the trees that Monica, sh as she showed in her slide, are not gonna be available at all locations. Most of the trees are available at most locations. So uh, click on the location nearest you, reserve your trees, and you will pick them up on March 17th or 18th. And they will be, um, there's instructions in, in those links on what, what hours are available at that location. So make sure you show up during those hours to pick up those trees. The people at those locations are volunteering for this effort. So um, just so you know, we are a nonprofit organization and um, everybody out there helping distribute trees are volunteers for this effort. Thank you, Kim. I do see a question here from Anonymous, um, and it is, can we get a detail from Monica's presentation to share with the people picking up trees? Um, and I think that we could probably share this web 
um, live stream webinar on our tree day page. The same one that Gwen just posted, tectn.org forward slash Tennessee tree day. Um, you can also find detailed information about the habitat, uh, our habitat guide on, and find the perfect place to plant your tree. And if the question is, can you get a copy of the slide deck? I'm sure we can provide that later. We can um, make that available as well. By emailing, um, email By emailing. to ectn.org. Yeah. That's our main email address. Yep. Um, yes, and I think, I think Brandy usually sends the recording to everyone who registered. So you can uh, watch the live stream later, the recorded version. And I did notice Kim said she's, she found the right place on the website to order reserve, reserve her trees and uh, what an incredible commitment she's making <laughs> that she wants to dedicate at least an acre to plant native trees. That's phenomenal. You will need about a hundred trees to fill that acre. So assuming hundred percent survival of those trees. So hundred trees will, will fill about an acre over time. Diane Sher asks, why was the American plum asterisk? We put asterisk next to the trees that are only available at certain locations based on where they're gonna do best in Tennessee. Um, some trees are very region specific. So we, we try to put the trees in communities where they're gonna thrive and have the best chance of thriving. And by the way, the tree quantities and species are always, there's always some limit from the nurseries because of how mother nature works. You never know which trees are gonna do well from the nursery. So that's why we um, don't always offer the same trees every year. For example, the pawpaw was not available this year for us in the quantities we needed. Yeah, someone asked how to order native pollinator seeds. Well, we also have those um, trees are phenomenal to help pollinators, but you can also plant a pollinator garden through our program. And a pollinator garden is where you plant seeds and the seed mixes we offer are flowers and grasses, native flowers, native grasses that support many of the same butterflies and insects that Monica showed in this presentation. So there is a link in the chat now. It's generate some buzz on our website, tectn.org slash generate some buzz. You can watch the video on how to how we recommend digging your garden. Really simple. One a one ounce seed packet will cover 50 square feet. So an entire 50 square foot garden. You can build that in about an hour. Now is a great time to plant the garden between now and March. So um, you can be ordering and planting your gardens immediately. I do see a question that says, can a tree order be amended to add more trees? And you can, you can always uh, place a separate order. Um, can't go back and redo, but yeah, you can get more trees. And I put the link for the generate some buzz um, into the chat, but it's, tectn.org forward slash generate some buzz for those pollinator seeds, native pollinator seeds. So um, I, I always appreciate seeing people show up at our live cast or live stream events to learn because we know that you care and that you're gonna go out and do something with that caring to help our environment, to improve the environment in Tennessee, planting trees, planting pollinator habitats, is one way you can make a difference that you get to benefit from as well, because you get to see the plants grow over time and you see the beautiful pollinator insects and other species show up you know, when those plants mature and bloom in the spring and the summer. And it's, it's a be beautiful thing to witness those butterflies and birds show up in the garden and in the trees. So thank you all for being here. And yes, when once this is posted on our YouTube channel, which should be by the end of this week. We'll also send it out to our email list. Like I said, the link to watch that video, then you can share that video with as many people as you want uh, so that uh, all your friends can help spread this message and plant trees for Tennessee Tree Day 
2023, which is, as we know, to be the largest community tree planting event. We're expecting about 20,000 volunteers to plant uh, some 100,000 trees, native trees and shrubs in Tennessee on that weekend um, in all 95 counties. That's, that's the effort we put together every year. Thanks in great part to Cynthia Hernandez, to Gwendolyn Blanton, um, who's a big part of that team, and Brandy Pruitt on the communications. And of course, thanks to Monica Pretz, who is a more recent addition to our team, who has been helping us plant those beautiful gardens at Stratford Stem and Cornelia Fort and other locations in Nashville and Middle Tennessee. So check out our website, get involved, choose a program, an opportunity that fits right for you. And feel free to reach out at any time by emailing tectn.org. Um, tectn, no, I'm sorry, tec at tectn.org. Can you put that in the chat just quickly that there is no mistake? Yep, thank you. I'm going to put that in the chat. Email tec at tectn.org. It's in the chat. Grab it now. If there are no other questions or comments, I'll go ahead and end the recording. Thank you for everyone who joined. Thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy planting. Mm -hmm.